That's what I Let's tell my kids. Just listen. To the Harris Gamos. <laughs> so Harris Gamos is a term that means the mystical marriage. And it comes from a ceremony that used to be done where pagan women would pick the god of their choice. Do you remember when we did the Ishva Devatar? When I talked to you about the sixth and the seventh chakra, and I told you here was a god of um, form, and here was the formless god. You guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. So that anything that you pick, and that's why people are devotees of certain gods, because they want to see the representation. So in the Heros Gamos, that's exactly what happened. The woman would pick a representation of a god, and she would marry symbolically that man, that god, okay? So they would find someone, they would dress up, and they would walk down the aisle and whatnot, symbolically marry themselves. They were marrying this god with this god. That god figure, that god head represented this, and she represented the journey she had been on when she found her inner God, and they got married. And there are your wedding rings. And then they would copulate and have sex. And then she was, you know, de-virginized and married to herself. That made her ready, or makes us ready, on the journey to then couple with another human being. Technically, technically, we shouldn't couple prior to this experience. That's not realistic, that's not the way it works. So oftentimes it's during relationships that we are doing this. Okay, that we are going on our journey and we are finding ourselves. And hence why a lot of relationships end, oh, my spouse went off to find themselves. Okay, what they're trying to do, attempting to do, is have a heros gamos, a marriage with self before they marry you. So here I have part of my model where I took the Heroes Gamos for the Mystical Marriage, or the Vesica Pisces, or um, Venn Diagram, and called it <laughs> the I, the I, and the We. And we're going to go into that next month, but I want to briefly tell you. This part of the person, the masculine, and again, we're not talking about gender, we're talking about energy. So let's just just for heterosexual sake for a moment, the man and the woman, part of the relationship. Each part is an I. 100%. Okay? This person has done their, their work. They've squared the circle. This person has done their work. They've squared the circle, and now they're both full. They're both 100. And so, relationship is the we. And I have it as a new entity. Your relationship in your partnership is its own entity. Does anyone remember when Mitt Romney said corporations are people too? Yeah. Okay, relationships are people too, people. It is a complete entity. It is living and breathing. It has its own rules. And we're going to get into the system and rules when we start next class. Maybe Thursday. I don't know. We'll see what happens with the final and all your papers and stuff. Okay? And my chemo. So I wrote, relationship, the we, is a new entity. Each partner brings 50% of their whole self to form the new entity, but doesn't lose themselves in the process. How many of you have been in relationships where you've lost yourself in the process? 
You either become the other person, I call this runaway bride syndrome. In the runaway bride movie, every single time Julia Roberts was going to marry someone, she turned into them. And if we remember, she was going to marry the last guy before Richard Gere came into the picture. Maggie was her name in the, in the movie. She was scheduled to marry this jock guy. And they were going to go camping or hiking in the Himalayas, I don't know, something. So Richard Gere very astutely asks one question. How does she like her eggs? Yeah. <laughs> Why did he ask that? Remember oh, how I said if you're going to ask a question, have a reason? She, yep. she, changed, she changed her taste, her likes. Depending on who she on, was yeah. with. Exactly. If you have runaway bride syndrome, you assume the identity of the other person. Okay? This is I call latch and leech. You latch onto that person, you have no identity of your own, or you do, but you choose to discard it. And you leech onto that person and become and assume their identity. This is a parasitic relationship. Not good. You want a symbiotic relationship. Not parasitic. And so Maggie would turn in to the guy. She liked the eggs how he liked the eggs. And Richard Gere, therapist, just one question. He knew what Maggie's issue was. And so in her particular case, I think her mother had died very young. Her father was an alcoholic. She couldn't leave home. She was never allowed to leave home figuratively. And you don't have to leave home. You don't have to leave your house in order to do this journey. Do not take it literal. Okay? But she was never allowed to leave home figuratively and uh, literally. And she took care of her father. And there was one scene where she's bringing him out of the bar and she puts him in the truck. And you see that this has been her life. And it's very common. This is a Neptune thing, Neptune archetype on your paper where people don't have an identity. Neptune rules the oceans. Neptune is the oceans, and what do the oceans do? The oceans take over. Look at what's happening here with the, these floods. The ocean just, water just takes over. It has no boundary. Water needs land in order to hold it in. So human beings that are Pisces, or a part in your chart where is Pisces, or a Neptune archetype, which we all have somewhere, is the part of you where you become parasitic, where you latch and you leech, and you don't have or don't maintain a boundary between you and the other person. And that's what happened. She never had that boundary. She had a mother-father-child relationship with her father as the alliance, since her mom was dead, and then she needed to turn into an adult adult. And it wasn't until she left Richard Gere at the altar that she actually did this. And you see her that she developed her lamps and she put them in New York and the store windows and blah, blah, blah. And then that was her journey. She went back to him and she brought the sneakers and said, I'm turning in my running shoes and I like Eggs Benedict. Mm -hmm. She found herself. Then you can have a we. Then you can have a real mystical marriage with another person. But the process is you must have one with yourself first. Okay? So that is the beginning of what we will call the truth is in the triangle. That's my model on how to understand what's happening in your relationships and why related exactly to this triangle, the mother-father-child triad, but now for your relationship. So the mother-father-child triad is intended to bring you to wholeness with yourself. So then you can embrace the whole mess of you and your partner and your family, etc. Any questions? Okay, I have a couple minutes. I just want to share a few things with you. This is a phenomenal book. It's called Signs and Symbols. 
and it has, in the back, it has all the glyphs. So here, the symbol I sent to you of the Philosopher's Stone, it talks about alchemy. It has all different kinds of different symbols. So if you want, you even have the astrological signs, you have the caduceus, you have the Jewish star, and then it also is broken up into alchemy, body language. This is one of the, the one of the games I invented that we're going to play next time um, has to do with body language, identity, and then different religions, different philosophies. So if you want, you can look at this. This is a great book. The glyphs on the back, those are called glyphs. These things that I draw here, these are all called glyphs. And I believe that one of your handouts has the glyphs and I spelled glyph wrong. I caught that today, so I'll edit that. So the glyphs are the symbols, like the infinity symbol. If I see the infinity symbol, I already know what it means. That's what I want you to get in the habit of. I want you to listen to a client and hear and see the symbol that they're speaking from. The more symbol you know, the better, because then you're gonna have a bigger repertoire. But if nothing else, please just learn the 12 archetype symbols and the names or what you're going to listen for and you're going to be able to extrapolate. This is a great book on Jung called Symbols of Transformation. And there are some images in here. And a bunch of explanation. So if you want to take a look at that. One of my favorite symbols and I actually want to do this activity with you guys, is the labyrinth. So the labyrinth, and I brought this little kit that I was gifted. It's called Meditative Mazes and Labyrinths. The labyrinth is not a maze, but it's actually like a, well, let me just show you some sam samples, and I'll pass around the box. This is one example. Labyrinths have one entrance and the same exit. They're not tricks. They're believed to be that when you walk into a labyrinth and you walk the path, that you're walking your spiritual path. There's a center in the middle, and here are a bunch of them so you can color. You can do, oh, this is the one I have at home. So I have this labyrinth on a huge a canvas. And I do labyrinth walks. And they're spiritual activities to help people walk this circle, walk this path on an actual canvas. So you can walk the whole path, reach the center circle as if you're going to the journey in the center of yourself. You can make a prayer, you can petition, some people meditate in the middle, some people put a stone, whatever the theme is, you can make different themes, and then they walk out. And it is believed that anything that happens on the labyrinth is, is a message. There is something called the labyrinth locator. They're all over the place. There's one in Miami Lakes, there's a ton in Miami, there's some in Del Rey. And if you go to www.labyrinthlocator.com, you can put in your zip code and you can walk the labyrinth. So one of the things that I've done with my family is every time we go on a trip, we locate, whether it's Europe or whether it's the States, we locate a labyrinth and we walk one in that area and we take a family picture. So it's become something nice. I have one and I would like to bring it. It's huge. So everyone will have to help carry it and fold it back up. <laughs> it's in my closet. I just have to have it put in my car. And then we'll go outside, maybe at the back of the parking lot, and we'll walk it one day. And it's very cool. And it's a wonderful symbol. And uh, the other thing that you can do is you can actually do finger walks. For people that are disabled or if you don't have a chance, you can walk it with your finger. And it does the same thing in the brain. Okay, so this is one that's like a coloring book. And there's a book with a bunch of explanations. These are very popular. There's a famous labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral in Paris, or not Paris, in France, 
that they do pilgrimages to walk these labyrinths. It is one of the oldest spiritual symbols in most philosophies have a version. There's one in there that's like a square, and that's the Native American one. Um, so there's different ones. The one I showed you, I think, is called the Baltic one. The Chartres Cathedral one is a very famous one. That's a very famous symbol. This book is called Metaphors of Healing. Symbols are like metaphors. And you can help clients learn if you tell them a story. Telling stories is a very effective way to learn. And so when you can use a metaphor to teach someone something, you can really help them. So this is called Playful Language and Psychotherapy in Everyday Life. I'm just going to open to any page. This, the topic is interpersonal relationships. They also have letting go, know and appreciate yourself, um, working towards success, mindset, so there's consideration for others. So let's read this one. Screwdrivers. You offer a flathead screwdriver to Joe who is fixing something. He says, I don't want it. It does not mean that your screwdriver is bad. It only means that you have a flathead screwdriver and Joe needs a Phillips. An hour later, Joe is going to call you and say, may I borrow that screwdriver now, please? This time he needs a flathead screwdriver. You interviewed for a job and were not selected. You felt rejected. I am no good. No one wants me. I am never going to an interview just to be rejected again. You took the rejection personally and put yourself down. Maybe you are a flathead screwdriver. If you keep going to your next interviews, you will find an employer who might say, where were you all this time? I was looking for your skills and could not find them. So you can give a little anecdote to a client, a little metaphor, and it goes a long way. That's like the one I told you the other day about being the scorpion. It's in my nature. Nature, tendency, essence doesn't change, behavior does. You'll remember that little metaphor. So this is a great book. Um, world mythology. This is not the one that I wanted to bring, but this one I had on my desk. There's the mythology Bible that is the one that I want you to see. But this one's good too. This one is, the, the thing I want you to see about it is the table of contents. So it's called Gods and Goddesses. In the beginning, every philosophy, every mythology has a creation story. Rebels and troublemakers, that's Uranus. Gods among us, bringers of mercy, love, and fertility, that's the moon and Venus. Lords of the battlefield, that Mars. The destroyers, that's the magician or Pluto. So you can see, and then it goes further. It goes heroes, then it goes women, then it goes monsters. So you can see that in every mythology or every philosophy or culture, there are the same archetypes repeated over and over and over again. The more you learn those, the better. This is Mythic Tarot. It's just another tarot deck if you want to see a lot of symbol. These tarot decks have books. So that's why I like to get them because you can learn a lot of the symbology even if you don't play with the deck. This is one of my favorites. This is the Book of Symbols. And it has, it's an amazing encyclopedia. And it has different sections. I can't see, I'm so blind. Creation and cosmos, water, air, fire, earth. So this one is broken down into the cosmos, the creation, all the creation stories. Then you have the plant world, and you have the animal world, and you have the human world, and the spirit world. So this is like the four elements, and then the fifth element and all of the myths and all of the symbols that are associated. And I absolutely love that book. And this one, last but not least, remember I taught you about the Sri Yantra? Yes. Okay, Yantras are symbols, and there's many different ones. This is the main one, this is the Sri Yantra. And this book is all on different Yantras. That's another rendition of the Sri Yanta. It explains it, it breaks it down, and these are all different. 
The yantra comes from Hindu mythology, and so you understand that, that there's different symbols, there's different ones, but depending on the different god that people believe in. So those are also very powerful symbols. And then this is a Jung book on archetypes. So there's a lot of great stuff. Please look at it, utilize it, play with it. The more you play with stuff, the more you become interested in it and well-versed. And these are labyrinth cards, like the labyrinth book and archetype cards. So any questions before we wrap up? Okay, thank you. If you haven't already, take your final. Everything's due to Thursday at noon.